Okay, we got some new prototype in. This is uh, the boards I was talking about that had the STM8s. Um, this is not the final design. Uh, I originally built this for uh, normal fits. And I won't be placing those today. Uh, but we're going to place everything else and test everything and make sure we have outputs. Uh, in the prior video, we made sure that the actual chipset that we want to use for power control uh, does work. Um, so as long as we can get outputs on these pins, uh, this should work. This should actually give us enough to uh, uh, test 485, uh, all the outputs and inputs, and especially the opto isolation on the 12 volt. Uh, all that circuitry is on here. Um, so I'll get started and I'll get this stenciled and we'll put it in the reflow oven and, and flow it real quick. Okay, here's the first board. And normally you take this down to the table. Uh, these are really uh, large components and not a lot of uh, actual pace that you have to displace, but that's the first board done. And there's the second. Okay, now I'm going to get some components and we'll get to placing. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with the whole assembly. I'm just going to show you the quick process and then I'm going to place it apart. Um, but basically, this is going to be CAT3 and that's on the back side of the board. This, this board has parts on both sides. Um, so we're going to place it real quick and ideally um, a, a vacuum pick or a set of tweezers. I usually use tweezers on uh, smaller parts um, or in a vacuum pick on larger parts. It's a lot easier to go straight down rather than having to, to worry about your X and Y placement. Um, the vacuum pick will actually let you kind of angle the part and drop it straight down. Okay, so we've got our two pick, uh, 
two caps. A lot of times what I'll do is I actually take a white piece of paper and put underneath everything. Uh, for this board it's really small so I'm not going to spend the time to do that. But that's usually a good good method of uh, this. What I found on small boards is to actually uh, kind of position yourself and to actually uh, to, to, to stay still the best method is to actually keep your hands still and actually rotate the board if you can. Um, that kind of gives you dual control and everything's uh, you know resting against something. And it just makes placement easier. And always always order a couple of spare parts um, I think on this prototype run uh, order at least a couple of everything I needed now on larger runs you'll actually want to increase that percentage so if you order three boards I would at least get a part or two spare uh, and, you know if you got ten boards I would try to get several more maybe five parts spare uh, at least on the uh, passives Okay, this is a really simple tool to use. Uh, you can pick these up for almost nothing uh, on Amazon. They actually make a better version of this. It's actually, I've got it over there on the other bench, uh, and it's actually powered. Um, I don't remember the brand name, but it's basically got two of these picks. Uh, and it actually has a valve, but these are really easy to use. Um, the big thing is to make sure you get planted and bring it down in an arc to the, to the pads. And it's that simple. Okay, so we placed the voltage regulator and the surrounding caps around it. Uh, now we got some diodes and, and some resistors on the back side that I'm going to place really quickly. Okay, so that's all of our resistors placed. Uh, now I like the diode. Uh, diodes are a little tricky sometimes, especially the smaller ones. You really have to pay attention to the markers. Okay, we've got one of these ready. I'm going to go ahead and take it over and start the reflow process on that while I'm finishing up the diodes on the other board. Okay, we got that one baking, and we're going to go ahead and uh, put the parts, the rest of the parts, on this one. Okay, that that board is assembled. Uh, we'll get ready. We'll check the old, the board that's in the oven. Uh, it's about to come out, and we'll stick this one in, and I'll get a video shot of it actually going in the oven and how I. I uh, do prototype re uh, reflowing. Okay, uh, basically I just use a, uh, a modified toaster oven. Um, and one of the things on the toaster ovens is you really have to, you almost have to have a flear or really pay attention to where the actual heat is leaking out. Otherwise you won't be able to meet the reflow profile. Um, this These ovens work really great. Um, I didn't have to actually add an element. They had plenty of elements in them and they can really come up to heat and work really well. Uh, but let's uh, pull this board out of the reflow and see what we have. Okay. That's the board we just assembled. Out of reflow. Uh, from first look, everything looks good. We'll, I'm going to place the other board and we'll start its process.
Okay, here's board number two. And you won't be able to see much in there. Um, I don't have any lighting. Um, and we should see it here in just a few minutes. Okay, while that other board's flowing, I'm going to go ahead and test this board. And basically what I've did is all of the components that actually generate take the 12 volt and turn it into uh, voltage that we can use with a microcontroller, which is 5 volt, uh, is actually on the back of the board. Uh, so this is, makes it a real easy way of uh, checking to see what we end up with as far as voltage goes before we actually use any components on the other side. Okay, a safe way of doing this uh, testing is to actually use a current limiting power supply. So you want to put it on low current and kind of ramp it up to where you expect it to run. That'll actually prevent you from really damaging anything. Now sometimes the quickest way to find out what's actually wrong uh, is to obviously smoke the part. In that case you'll, you'll want quite a bit of current to actually either heat up the part um, or on smaller parts you need to see complete failure to find out what's wrong. Okay, so far so good. Okay, we're putting in about 12.977 volts. Uh, I actually have the uh, power supply set at uh, 13. And our output is, uh, whoop. Well, if we can get on the right pin. Okay, we're at uh, right at 5 volts, 4.9336 volts. Uh, so our, our power regulation is working. Um, I'm going to just check it on the scope real quick and make sure that it uh, looks like a solid DC power. Okay, it looks like we're good. Um, so in prototyping something, one of the things this is, this is uh, this kind of stage is generally you want to bring up power rails first if you possibly can. Now a lot of boards on really complex designs you can't really do that. Um, and, and typically I don't because typically I'm using either an existing known design uh, or I'm using something like TI's Power Wizard or something like that. And uh, They've already pre-built a lot of these modules and everybody knows that they work. Uh, you do still need to check them uh, to make sure that you didn't make a mistake. Uh, but the likelihood of it actually failing out the gate is, is very low. Um, so I'm happy with this. Uh, one thing I noticed, I'm going to have to touch up. I actually lost a resistor when I was putting on the thing. And I found that resistor. And it's tied to the leg here. It must have fell on the leg and it actually tombstoned up. Um, and I'm just going to pull that off real quick. so that. Okay, now I'm going to assemble the uh, front side of the board. I've still got the other board over there. It just came out of the oven and it's still hot. Uh, so basically, uh, this side's not that bad. Most of the components on this side are actually fairly large. Uh, so this should go pretty quickly and uh, we'll see what we have. And like I said in the previous video, we already have some test code that we can run on these. Okay, I got the top sides done. Um, they're cooling right now in the oven and we'll pull them out. Uh, and kind of double check everything. Really the only issues I really expect to see um, You know obviously a major design issue which we want to discover now uh, Which is unlikely, but it may happen um, Diodes sometimes especially if you notice when I assemble this I, I typically don't use the uh, The microscope on parts this big uh, But those diodes are really the markings on them are really small and I may have gotten one backwards or something like that But that's easy enough to swap out or replace or flip around um, so when they, when they get done with the oven here, we're going to bring them over, test everything that we can. Uh, and obviously they're not going to do much until we program them. I do have voltage uh, 
rail lights, which are basically LEDs. And I highly recommend you try to do that on any design that you do. Simply for the fact that uh, it gives you a good indication of is the thing turning on? Um, do you have, you know, are all your rails up and running? You're talking about just a few cent part uh, to actually get a good visual indication of whether it's working or not. Uh, so I'm going to go grab those out of the oven. I'll bring them back uh, on that particular one. Um, I really did the same exact stencil method. The only difference that I, I actually took my Oshpark uh, stencil templates, I guess is what these are. Um, but usually this, these, these hold the board. And they hold the board uh, at, a, at the correct level where you can just tape this down and stencil over it. On this board, I had parts on the back. And, and basically what that means is I had to have some overhang and I only use these to actually lift the board up so that the parts would not hit the parts on the bottom wouldn't hit while I was stenciling and I held it with my fingers um, that's the fastest way I've found to stencil these small boards and it, it works really well um, if this was a more complex board obviously we'd have to do something different um, I have a, a, a similar set of this that's actually mounted on a, a PCB board that has a hole cut um, and that's what keeps the uh, board up off on more of my complex designs that have double-sided, uh, that are double-sided designs. So it's one thing to keep in mind when you're doing both sides of a board uh, is to do the stenciling on the other side. You're gonna have to lift that board up somehow and then keep a you know a nice plane that you can still do the stencil. Simple boards, I recommend just putting two fingers on the edge of the board, holding the stencil, and working your pace through the apertures. Um, on a more complex board, that's not possible. Uh, and you're going to have to actually mount that board and get it stable and, and flat and level. Okay, I'm going to go grab the uh, parts out of the oven and we'll check them out. Okay, I pulled them out of the oven. Uh, visually, everything looks good. Um, I think the only thing that I really see uh, is... Um, a missing resistor which I can I'll have to look that value up and replace it uh, the reference is R6 on this particular board it looks like I'm misplacing it or uh, more than likely it's somewhere in this big bag of parts that happens sometimes um, looking at the I haven't looked at the schematic but I believe I remember where this is at in the schematic um, that's not going to cause an issue basically it's just the voltage divider uh, for the 12 volt connect or uh, 12 volt uh, rail so we can uh, run the voltage into an ADC and do a voltage divide uh, to be compatible with the 5 volt ADC here. Uh, so that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, both, both boards look really good. The alignment looks good. Um, I don't see any obvious bridging. I am going to pull out the microscope here and just take a quick look just to make sure we don't have anything. I don't want any dead shorts or have to replace any whole parts if all I need to do is correct a bridge or something like that. Uh, but all in all, it looks really good. Okay, I've taken a look. This particular board, um, I'm fairly certain that I'm going to have to do a little bit of rework on U4. Uh, but it's actually not the solder process. What's actually happened is I must have, when I took the data sheet information from this chip, um, I either did a really tight tolerance on the, uh, the recommended footprint, um, or it was just off completely but it looks just a little bit narrow and this is slightly shifted a little bit and just you know missed it barely caught maybe two of the pins um, but ideally to make this part a little bit easier to solder uh, I'll probably just increase the pad size in general um, and make it a little bit easier to, to work this other board um, it got it got more centered up and the part is connected it's connected just on the very back edge of the uh, pad um, and should work just fine and that will tell us what we want to know um, whether this opto isolation uh, circuit that we built uh, will actually uh, do what we want and get our 12 volt inputs uh, to the uh, to the STM8 without burning it up hopefully okay I'm just gonna hook one of these up um, and again you know you want to use something that's got current limiting um, I'm just going to allow just a little bit of current and hopefully we don't see any uh, 
snap, crack, crackle, pop, or we don't let the magic smoke out. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but basically we've, we're powering up. Nothing's, uh, no dead short. Uh, a lot of times on a lot of designs, I'll at least check for, uh, you know, short to ground. Uh, but we already checked that in the previous step. Um, you know, visually looking at something this simple, you can generally tell if you have a short. Um, but we've got the 5-volt uh, and the 12-volt rail. That's what those two LEDs are indicating, are both coming up. And the second board, so we're good here. Like I say, one of these boards, I'm fairly certain that the uh, opto is not actually connected, uh, but that won't really affect anything as far as what we're wanting to do with these boards. Okay, in closing with this part, um, basically we've got two working boards here. Uh, what this is gonna, uh, get us to is we we found out some valuable information obviously the footprint for the opto uh, issue is something we want to fix before I do the uh, final uh, design um, and also uh, we basically have hopefully two programmable chips with the uh, 485 uh, driver enabled so I'll be able to set one of these up as a master and one as a slave and we can start developing a protocol that uh, will cause these to do things um, if they're not in standalone mode. Again, I still plan on supporting this in standalone. And basically what that means is um, if you've got a razor and you just have literally one or two things, and that's a majority, um, that's currently what I have. I don't have a radio or anything like that yet uh, in this particular razor. Now my old razor, I had tons of stuff in it. But again, I had the huge multiplexer and I had it all hooked up. Um, my current razor, you know, you have you basically have winch power to the relay. And that's not what actually powers the winch. It's just what powers the solenoid that actually kicks over and engages the winch. So I have that. That is a uh, accessory output. Um, and that right now I have that attached to, you know, a regular lighting relay. Um, also, uh, I've got an LED light bar and that consumes quite a bit of uh, amperage. Uh, so for people that just want uh, a little more advanced control and a lot smaller package uh, and to me it's a lot simpler to wire uh, mainly because one you don't have to get run heavy gauge wires up into the actual dash area um, you can pretty much keep all your wiring really close uh, right to the terminal point and two this is going to do neat things if you want to actually have accessories on uh, you can extend the timer and that's exactly what I'm going to do here um, I think my default timer on the Polaris that's not adjustable that I know of uh, I'm actually going to extend that timer um, so I'm going to have an input into this that actually tells me when I've turned the switch off but the accessories that are connected to this are going to stay on much longer than what that does um, so if I want to leave a light on the other thing this is going to do is it's going to watch my current consumption if something's wrong it's going to turn it off It'll also watch the voltage. So if I, if I, even if I'm just puttering around and um, actually run my battery down or run the voltage down to a dangerous level where I may not be able to get it cranked back, um, it's going to turn that accessory off and allow the stator to actually charge the battery. Um, if you have any questions up until this point, uh, please drop me a line. Uh, I have a few people uh, with a club that I'm with that are actually going to uh, install the final version of this, or at least the beta version of this. Um, that have not a, that you know have a bone stock razor, and that's one of the things they dreaded. A lot of it they didn't want a really big wiring mess. Um, you know, I kind of showed them what the relay setup looks like by default, and it's kind of a you know a big cluster of wires uh, that you end up having to hook up. And this is way simpler. Uh, you can use low voltage wiring. Uh, low amperage, low current wiring up to your switches. Uh, this pretty much, if you looked at it in the razor, um, it would be hot in, hot out to your accessory. Um, 
and all the other lines coming in around us will be very, very small. You could use, you know, 20, 28 gauge wire if you wanted to uh, for all the other connections. Uh, and then on the ground side of the lot, you could attach that anywhere you'd like. And typically I recommend either running that straight back to the battery or running it to the ground bar. Uh, the ground terminal is already in the razors. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, be sure to drop me a line.